we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Dolores Fabiano, the Executive Director of the uh, South Niagara Chambers of Commerce. Thanks for joining us for um, what is the first of three very informative workshops. I, uh, I want to start by acknowledging our co-hosts, the Grimsby, Lincoln, and West Lincoln Chambers of Commerce, and the Niagara Board of Trade and Commerce. We welcome all of our members uh, across Niagara. I want to acknowledge our sponsor, uh, Venture Niagara. Uh, Frank Rupsik and his team at Venture Niagara are great supporters of the local business community. So we thank them for the support that they always provide. We also want to uh, thank our tech sponsor, uh, Brian LaChapelle and his team at B4 Networks. They always make sure that we sound so good. So thank you, Brian. Today, we're thrilled to have with us uh, Alyssa Milo. She's the founder of the Zen Strategy. Uh, Alyssa's worked for Fortune 500s and startups, so her marketing expertise, as expertise is uh, uniquely intertwined with a deep understanding of the entrepreneur. She has all of the big brand secrets and she's ready to share. So Alyssa, let's start sharing. Hi guys. Good morning everyone. This is my first time officially doing a formal style Zoom webinar. So I brought my friend um, Grogu as my audience because I can't see any of you and it's so hard. So I'll pretend that he's representing all of you. And if you get bored with what I'm saying, you can just like stare into his eyes because he's so cute. Okay, on to marketing. I'm gonna share a screen um, so that everyone can see the presentation. Okay, are we looking good here? Dolores and Brian, they can give me a, a heads up if things don't look good, but looks hopefully good. everyone can see. It looks great. Okay, awesome. Okay, so welcome everyone. Today we're gonna to talk about diversifying communication channels for growth, which is a fancy way of saying, we're gonna to try to grow our business through connecting with new people in different places, maybe in new ways with new products. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually quite simple. And I'll take you through some tools and strategies on how to go about doing that. So what are going to be your takeaways from today? I want to make sure you're sitting here listening, spending your time, drinking your coffee and actually getting something out of this. So first and foremost, here's what we're going to work on today in the next hour. Firstly, I hope you'll be able to take away with you some tools. So firstly, um, foundational branding tools. How can you make sure that you're connecting to the right people in these new markets, in this new way, through these new channels as effectively as possible? The next one is I hope you'll take away some strategy, particularly strategy around building an effective and actionable and measurable communication plan. Because really you can have all the ideas in the world and a laundry list of things to do, but unless it's organized and prioritized, you're just gonna wanna stick your head in the sand and like not do any of it. So having a plan is a good way to start. And lastly, as a takeaway after the workshop, um, I'm going to set you guys up with a bunch of worksheets. So a lot of the tools and the strategy that we're talking about today, you'll have your own little worksheets that you can print off and work through uh, at your leisure about your own personal businesses. <clears throat> good. All right. So a little bit about me, Dolores already gave me such a lovely introduction, thank you. Um, I am in a nutshell, a fractional CMO. So I come in and out of companies offering a marketing expertise um, service. And um, I do two things. One, I support them from a branding perspective and marketing planning, but also I stick around to help them execute stuff. So in the same way a CMO would, where they actually come up with plans and actually get things done, I help my clients to do that as well. Um, Fractional CMO work is really awesome for me because I get to bump in and out of all kinds of different dynamic companies and learn about different owners and learn about different customers. Um, and it's really beneficial for my clients as well because it's a fraction of the price and the time and the energy to bring in a high caliber expert like me part time versus hiring a more likely junior um, executive. Uh, so that's where I offer benefit to my clients. So let's get started. Your brand foundation. So I recognize that branding feels like a buzzword. People throw up branding all over the place. And a lot of times 
<clears throat> smaller business owners think of branding as being something that, oh, that's what the big guys do. Like that's what Dove Soap does because there's 12 different soap bars and they all do the same thing on a shelf and they need to come up with some elaborate scheme to make people choose their soap over someone else's. <clears throat> I totally get that. And that's not untrue. However, branding is really simple. It's, it's literally just knowing your target and the benefit that you bring to the lives of your target. And if you have both those things, boom, you got a brand and that's all you need. So it doesn't have to be complicated. Visual branding is different. Often people confuse visual branding with foundational branding. Visual branding is things like color schemes and logos. We're gonna put a dot here and a dot there. We're gonna come up with a really cool name that everyone's gonna remember. Um, and that's nice. And it adds a level of professionalism to your business for sure. But we're not talking about the tip that today. And realistically, that's not what makes sales. It really doesn't. So for new business owners out there who are maybe stressing about like, oh, how do I make my logo? And I do all this work to like build this brand. Really, if you've got the ugliest logo and the worst colors, but you know exactly who your target is and you know exactly what to say to them, they don't care what you look like. They care about what you're giving to them in terms of a product or service. So don't sweat the small stuff um, from, a, from a visual branding perspective, <clears throat> just know your core brand. And that's where the heart of everything is. So in a nutshell, and I like this little quote, is a strong brand is like foundation of a skyscraper. How can you reach the sky without it? And especially when it comes to growth, if you don't know what you're about and who you're talking to, how are you supposed to expand or grow or offer a new product if you don't even know what you're talking about to begin with? So it's really important to get a good handle on that at the start. So there are three things that I think are most important in terms of understanding your brand. And they're the three W's, who, what, where. And you're probably thinking if you're an established business owner, like, duh, Alyssa, I totally know who my target is. And I totally know what product I'm offering. Why am I not watching a YouTube video right now? And I get it, but bear with me. So we are talking specifically about growth here. And you can grow in a few different ways. <clears throat> First, you can grow your business through decreasing your cost of goods. But that's pretty hard to do because I imagine most of you have made a real effort to be as economical as possible with your cost of goods to make sure that your profit is as high as it can possibly be. So that one's like, yeah, great. If you find a new supplier, you win. But otherwise, it's probably not that feasible. You can charge more. You can hike your prices. And that's cool if the market allows you to do that, if the market dictates a need for your product or service that much that you can hike your prices. But probably in the grand scheme of things, you might piss off a few clients and lose a few customers. Um, and it may not be that beneficial for you in terms of growth. The most easiest and logical way to grow is to seek out more customers. And you can seek out new customers in a lot of different ways. There are many parameters here. You can connect with the same customers in a new place. You can offer <clears throat> new things to new people. You can connect with new people in new places. Um, and most importantly, you can offer new products to the same people in the same place. But no matter which <clears throat> combo of growth you choose, it leads you to have to revisit your branding foundations because you need to understand who this new cart target is in this new place and to really assess how what you offer is making their lives better. And lastly, we get to our where. So where, and a bit of how, is really where do you properly frame what you offer so that your customers will hear it and recognize that they need and want what you got. And that's, those are the three things in a nutshell. And these ring true for B2B or B2C. It does not make a difference. So let's start with our who. So that's your target. And you can call your target lots of different things. They can be your client, your customer, your market. I like target. I'll flip around between them. Don't mind. It accounts for everything, whatever, whatever term I use. But your customer, in a nutshell, is everything because they buy your product or service. And guess what? You don't have a business unless someone is buying from you. And your job is to find out what they want and then deliver it. Simple as that, right? So simple. No, it's not. But in a nutshell, that's like, that's what it is. That's the heart of it. So who are they? It's fun to think about your target. 
it shouldn't feel overwhelming or scary because there's lots of ways to really get to know your target. So I encourage you to be specific and be creative. <clears throat> In Unilever, Walmart, and Nike, we would literally make up worlds for our targets, like full out what kind of dog they had, what kind of family they have, what kind of house they live in, what they like to do as their hobbies. You can really flesh this person out. And it doesn't mean you're ostracizing anyone else who's buying your product. It just means that you have a good picture of someone in your head. And it means that the way you talk to them is more authentic when you actually can imagine them and know who they are. And you can actually talk to real people. So big brands call it focus groups or client chats or customer chats or whatever it is. You can call people up and talk to them. And you guys can do that too. Even if you're in a small business, you could always talk to someone. Maybe it's your cousin, maybe it's your aunt, maybe it's a friend of a friend who is your ideal target and just chat with them about what they think about your product or your product sphere or the vertical that you're in um, and get some information from them. And then when you're thinking about growth, it's really important to think about how this new target or the same target in this new place is different from your old target. And there might be some subtle differences. And as a result, your communication to them needs to be tweaked a little bit. So one of the essential questions, whether you're having a conversation with your cousin or you know, doing investigating work on the internet or probing different people's social media um, channels to learn more about them, there are a few key questions that you wanna really uncover and try to answer about your target. The first is what are their goals? What do they want to get out of an experience with you and your service or product? Um, what are the problems they face? How did your product or service solve some of the junk that's going on in their life right now? What are their fears? Fears drive action. So fears are really important. Um, what are they scared of? What bad experiences have they had with competition, which makes them not want to work with you? Um, what kind of things do you help to mitigate in the conversation that you have with them to alleviate the fears? If you know the fears, you know what to say to them to alleviate those. And then what are their desires? Everyone has dreams. If you promise someone's dream on a plate, they're gonna be like drooling over it. So make sure you know what they really want so you can really connect with them. And then once you have the answers to all these questions, you can really begin to understand how to speak to your target so they'll hear you. This is a cold heart fact. If you are planning to grow just because it's not the field of dreams, just because you build it does not mean clients will come. And that's an important fact to remember. Diversifying is not always an easy transition. It may mean you need to rethink how you frame your business and what worked in the past might not work again. So it's important to really look at your new target in the new place with fresh eyes. So let's go on to what. What is our position? Our position in the market, our position in the world, how we frame our product or service. And positioning, and I like this quote a lot, positioning is not what you do to the product, it is what you do to the mind of the prospect. And you really have the power to choose this positioning. So for example, and it's a nice way to think about your competition too, because there is no competition. I know it feels like there is because you see other companies that might be doing what you're doing or selling the same product. But if you have a strong and unique positioning, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that 20 other people do exactly what you do. If you're someone relatable and you have a great way of talking to them so they listen, those other guys don't even matter. It's irrelevant. Um, so for example, say you had four companies that sell cookie decorating kits and they <clears throat> communicate their cookie decorating in different ways. It's convenient. You don't have to bake your own cookies. The cookies taste really good. Um, you know, it's fun to decorate, but one company frames their cookie boxes differently. They talk about cookie boxes as being a way to make family time. It's a way to connect with your six-year-old so they stop watching Power Rangers on the couch. And you can actually have a conversation about your day with them. And it becomes family time. It becomes fun, quality experience with your children. That somehow makes that cookie box feel a whole lot more enticing. Like, yes, I want a cookie box because I really want my kid to stop being on FaceTime. And I really want to find a fun way to get them engaged and connect. I want to say this outside of COVID world because most of us with children just want to ship our kids like out and away from us, but pretend we're in the old world for a minute when you need like some time with your children. Um, so that's one example of how positioning can make a big difference, even if your product is the exact same as someone else's. Okay, 
So then we get into features versus benefits. A lot of companies focus on their features and features are nice because they are what make you unique. So a feature is in a, in a definition, a unique attribute that your product or service has. It's the awesome things that your product or service make different or better than others. And that's great. You can tout your features till the cows come home. But what your target is really looking for are the benefits. And the benefits are what's the impact of that product or service on my reality. That's cool that you have whatever you're touting, but how does that affect me? And that's really what they care about. So features and benefits must go together. And here's a nice exercise to try to practice that within your own company. So it's called kitchen table logic. Um, thank you, Growth Associates, who I stole this from. Um, it's a combination of your benefit and your feature. So it goes the benefit because of the feature. And here are a few examples. Um, the benefit I get or customers get is that they get to run more miles in extra comfortable shoes because of the feature, the air cushion inside each sole. Another one example is you get the freshest flowers because we have a greenhouse on site. Yay. You get healthy and safe for your body produce because of our unique organic growing process. And lastly, if you're pregnant, this is the best. You get to sleep with a body conforming pillow for the best, most comfortable night sleep ever because of advanced material developed by NASA. So see the combo there? And you can create a bunch of these for your company as well. It will be in the worksheet. So you've come up with your kitchen table logic, then we're gonna take it to a next level. And this is where we're gonna start working on actually creating a position statement. So it's developing your genuine position. There are two things that are really important within defining your position. The first is a differentiator. And that's what can your brand, very similar to a feature to some degree, what can your brand offer that others can't or don't? And what can your brand say that others can or don't? So think about how you are unique to some degree, because that does matter. But what matters most, again, are the benefits of that differentiator. So what does your brand do for your customers that is emotional and tangible? What difference does it make in their lives? And you can be dramatic with this. Like a cookie box is about family time and quality bonding with your kids. Like it's decorating cookies. So be creative. Again, I go back to the big guys. Dove has literally made their products about self-esteem. Using a bar of soap is about making you feel better and making young girls feel better about themselves. You can go big with this. Don't be scared. So here are some, uh, some examples of differentiators and benefits. And the two kind of correlate in their order of appearance here. I'll just give you a few. Um, so a differentiator is high quality organic beauty products. And the benefit though, is that you, in your experience of buying this, get a special ongoing personal shopping experience. The other differentiator can be the softest cotton and the cutest mummy and knee designs. And what is the benefit? It leaves to moms feeling a whole lot more bonded and excited about doing things with their baby. So those are a few examples. And again, you can work through these on your own and they're kind of fun to create. And then we got brand position statements. So this is how you put them all together. So it's a combination of we will help our customer who has a problem to achieve or experience a benefit. Unlike our competition, our solution offers the difference. So here's my example. Uh, I help SMEs and startups establish their brand positioning by building a communication strategy and actually execute those plans to fruition with measurable growth. Unlike a full-time hire, partnering with a fractional CMO results in high caliber, hit the ground running executive without the time, risk, and cost associated with a permanent, likely junior employee. So that gives you a sense of it. So it's kind of a mouthful, but you can break this up and utilize it in lots of different ways once you really internalize it and, and feel like you own it. So next is where. A communication plan is the union of marketing and sales. And I truly believe that marketing and sales are not different. They are essentially elements of your business that operate, they do not operate in silos, they operate in tandem. An ad involves sales psychology, 
a pitch deck must communicate your brand position or else what the heck are you going to say to your client to get them to buy from you? These two things live happily in gray space together. So a communication plan is really important to help you actually get things done. You may have an amazing laundry list of all kinds of stuff you know you want to do from a sales and marketing perspective, but it's really hard to organize it because it feels like a lot. So having a plan drives awareness. Fact, if you have a communication plan, it means you're communicating to your target and it means they're more aware of your product or brand or service. Awareness leads to more sales. So how do you make a simple, measurable, and effective communication plan? So I'm going to give you a bit of a strategy to help do that. First and foremost, I recommend you brainstorm. You literally get a piece of paper, get your little whiteboard, get your eye notes, whatever you prefer, and make a list of all the awareness drivers that you can think of for your new target in the new place or your new product, whatever that might be. Go to town, just stream of consciousness, <clears throat> like barf that stuff out, all the different tactics and ways you can connect with them. Think of relevant channels, be creative. <clears throat> so some examples are, I'm going to update my website. I'm going to do some CEO optimization with Google posts. I'm going to create an Instagram account. I'll do some live Instagram videos to make myself seem like more of an authority on the topic I talk about. Uh, you're going to do some e-marketing newsletters, follow up with post evaluations or do some presentations. So some examples, get them all down. Then you're going to organize them. Yay, organizing. So here's a little grid for you. You're going to take all those different ideas and you're going to put them in these quadrants. So there's high impact, low impact, easy and difficult. Let's take rebuilding our website. That costs a bit. It takes a lot of time and energy and effort to think about, but it has a lot of impact because a website is literally the home for your company, especially now. So it's probably a high impact difficult. If you want to do a Google post, you know, you already did some social posts, you have some idea of what you want to say, you already posted something on LinkedIn, so you can just do the same thing. Take that content, put it in a Google post to increase your SEO. That's probably easy. It doesn't have the highest impact, but that's okay. It'll make a difference on your SEO, so well worth doing. Next, we want to establish KPIs, and these are key performance indicators. This is the cloud cycle. Key performance indicators are essential for every marketing or sales initiative you do. There is no point in doing something without actually measuring if it's, a, if it's a success or not. Giving yourself a bit of a benchmark to say, I did this, it worked. I did this, it didn't. So the little cloud cycle takes you through that process. So you make a plan, you have your idea of what you wanna do, your tactic, you put a KPI towards it. I want to get through my new website, 10 more people a month calling me for, for a meeting. Cool. Then you execute that plan. Then you measure that plan. And then you write your learnings from that plan. And then when you're going to plan again, you take into account those learnings and you go through the cycle again. And it's important to always assess the time and money you spend on initiatives. Otherwise, it's like throwing mud against the wall to see what sticks. And that's just crazy. So lastly, how do you actually organize all these actions now that you've prioritized them in your grid? So I recommend starting with high impact, easy. Obvious. That's low, low hanging fruit there. What makes the most bang for your buck, costs the least, and is the easiest to execute now. So you can make yourself a little grid. You can do this in an Excel sheet. You can do it on a whiteboard. You can do it wherever you want, but make yourself some columns and they're going to be your tactics, details. So basically a to-do list, your KPI, who's assigned to it. If you have people who can help you, that's awesome. And the results. <clears throat> so your tactic is to, let's say, update your homepage. Great. What do you have to do to get that done? You need to revise your user flow. So look at how that homepage is flowing and see where are you losing people? Where is it boring? Where are you kind of not getting that click through that you want? You need to write some copy. You need to maybe hire a designer because I don't know, I got a WordPress site and I sure as heck don't know how to use it. I made something look like basically a grade eight made a website and then I called my, my web guy and I was like, please help me make this look less terrible. So sometimes it's helpful to outsource. Don't feel like you have to do everything. And then maybe find some better imagery. So, you know, if you've got some stock image from the 80s, then, uh, you know, maybe update that. KPIs, let's say you want to book 10 new meetings a month because of it. You're going to assign it to the super awesome coordinator on your team, Sally, and then we're going to put our results. Cool. And you can do this for every tactic. And you can do it on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, whatever you want. 
All right, so we are at 33 minutes. So I kind of rushed because I was worried that I was gonna run out of time, but it gives us more time for questions. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, in summary, diversifying for growth is about reaching new customers in a new place or in a new way. And it can be all those things, which is like a lot to bite off and chew, good for you. Or it can be one or two of those things in partnership. And it's really important when you're diversifying either in a different channel or in a new market to think of your three W's. Who? Who is your target? And even though you think you know your target, how they changed. If you used to talk to them in, um, you know, maybe Google ads, but now you've made an Instagram channel and you have a certain amount of followers and there are certain types of followers, they might need to hear different things than who you talk to in the big world of Google. Now you have a particular type of person that's really following you on Instagram. How do you talk to them in a different way? Um, if you're changing your business to go from Canada to the US, because yay, we can do that now because we're working in our attics all the time and we can talk to anybody. Um, how do Americans think about your product differently than Canadians? Maybe it's the same type of person. You're still, you know, selling your service to um, a manufacturing company and those owners are kind of living in the same reality. But US culture is obviously very different than Canadian culture. So what does that target think or do differently that forces you to reframe to really connect with them? And then what? What are you bringing to the table? So we know you have great features, we know you have great benefits, but do you need to change that benefit or communicate a different feature to really reach that target based on their fears, pains, desires? Um, and then where? Where are you gonna reach them? How are you gonna connect with them? And this gets into marketing tactics, but those tactics need to be thought out in a logical way. Um, think about where they are, think about what they do, and what the best way is to connect with them. And then put yourself, uh, give your, do yourself a favor and do a bit of planning for it. Think about what you can do soon, what make, takes less effort, what can make the biggest impact now, and start with that so you're not overwhelmed. Because really, that laundry list of stuff that you have to do just makes you want to stick your head in the sand and pretend it's going to go away. <laughs> but it won't, and you won't grow without it. So those are your three W's and your summary. Um, worksheets that I'll send along will give you kind of frameworks to do all of the things that I talked about, defining your target, creating your positioning, um, and then putting together a bit of a plan. This is me. Um, I will email everyone so you'll have my email. If you want to follow me on Instagram, feel free. I'm at the Zen Strategy. Um, and I post, you know, regularly about marketing tips and ideas and thoughts. Sometimes I take pictures with Grogu, change it up. And then you can feel free to check out the website at www.thezenstrategy.com. All right, so as a quick final thing, um, there are more workshops to come. If I didn't totally bore you to death, um, feel free to join me again on February 11th, where we'll be talking about finding value in digital platforms without feeling like you want to put your head in the sand because digital platforms can be very overwhelming. And we'll talk about everything from social to SEO optimization um, to just operational tools that will make your life a little easier and better. And then on the 25th, John from On Demand Staffing is going to come and talk to you guys about best practices beyond COVID to make sure that your employees are feeling safe and supported and secure. On-demand staff staffing is awesome. They are such a high integrity company. They are a wealth of knowledge. They care so much about their clients and they care so much about their staff. And they're like the okay cupid of staffing where they'll find the best matches and, and really make the most of that experience for their clients. So join John, he has so much information um, and that's on the 25th. And that's it. So. Um, I hope people put questions up. <laughs> Does it look like there are any questions, Dolores? Yeah, well, I have, I have one, so I'll get it started. Great. Um, so through your experience with both the big brands and, and the startups, uh, I'm just curious, um, what was the most successful campaign that you participated in and what was the biggest flop? And you, uh, can keep the players anonymous, uh, to protect their identity. <laughs> in terms of what I did within my career? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. 
two things that feel like personal wins, um, I would say. So one was um, I was in customer marketing, which is a division of, of Unilever. Um, and it was so long ago, I don't mind actually saying what it was, but um, I worked with Walmart. So I was trying to find marketing campaigns to do at Walmart, which is very difficult because Walmart has a very regimented way of operating and they're very supportive, but they're tough. They're a tough customer, that's for sure. So I put together a series of um, cooking videos for my former brand, Knorr. And so it was so fun. It was the best experience, like making these fun cooking videos. I got to have a lot of autonomy because I had a small budget and I was kind of scrappy and everyone sort of forgot about me. And so that's what I really loved about doing that job in particular. And Walmart was super excited about it because no one had ever created something that unique for them. Um, so that was really awesome. And then I would say, um, I found it a struggle when I went to Walmart, to be honest, because they were at a stage where, and they're much more open now for sure and more modern, but at that time they were very, um, a little old school with doing a lot of just traditional ads. And I found that a little bit stifling, but we actually got an opportunity because their Walmart e-commerce page was just starting to get developed back in like 2010, I think it was. And I got to do a series of fun um, electronic videos where we actually smashed electronics. And I forget actually why. Oh yeah, it was for a new campaign to get rid of like your old crummy electronics and what you could do to them and buy new cheaper ones at Walmart or like Walmart ones for a great price. And it was like a slow-mo phantom cam and we got to just like smash printers and smash phones. So that was a positive one, but, but it was hard at first because I felt like I couldn't really be that creative. Right, right. So do you find that um, um, are smaller companies more flexible and open um, to changing um, their plan or, or not? I mean, I, I would think that smaller ones would be, but, but what's your experience been? Yeah, it's kind of the best of both worlds. And that's why I love bringing sort of bigger company knowledge in terms of strategy and planning, because there's a lot of formal planning and strategy because you're dealing with huge budgets. You can't, you can't throw mud against the wall and see what sticks. Like there has to be a very regimented plan to make sure that you're taking calculated risks in everything you do. And so I think that learning can be applied to small businesses, but at the same time, they can be so much more scrappy and creative with what they're doing. So they have a lot more ability to think about the logical plan behind what they're doing, but also do a lot more and be a lot more creative with what they're doing. And I think that sometimes um, small brands think that, oh, I can't do any fun marketing because, or any interesting or valuable marketing because I'm so little. And I put plans together for my clients all the time of tactics. And I make the ones that cost money pink. And often in our list, we'll have 20 to 40 white stickies of ideas and like two pink ones because there's so much you can do to grow your business that costs you nothing um, as a small business which is awesome and so i imagine that that our next session on the 11th um you know a lot of that has to do with digital platforms and social mm -hmm. media um and so we'll probably get more into that on the yeah 11th. yeah for sure and and also getting into sales funnels and crm and um really making an impact with the group of individuals you have already as warm warm leads or warm targets how do you reach them how do you connect with them so you can grow your business that way and they're just they're just in a terrible term they're sitting ducks like they're just waiting for you being like we like you talk to us sell something to us um and those are the people that you really want to talk to because don't don't forget them they're like they're like waiting for you right. um so those are free and and really accessible ways to grow too great so we yeah. do have a question that's just come right. in from Kevin. Um, and uh, he says, my company has found success working with podcasts that focus on games we create materials for. How would you suggest setting up a strategy to measure the success of this type of advertising? Great question. Oh, I love that. Um, so I feel like there's value in podcast partnerships in, obviously it has to be a give and take. So there needs to be something in it for you which really is just exposure through this amazing podcast, but what's in it for the podcast and what's in it for the podcast listeners. So a nice way to do that, which also helps you measure is giving some kind of offer that's special or unique to those, to that podcast and their listeners. So maybe it's a bit of a discount. Maybe it's a bit of a code, um, whatever it is, it can be small. Um, it makes them feel special. It makes them feel unique. It makes you something of value to the podcast listener um, because they get something out of it. 
And um, because they can offer something awesome to their listeners and their listeners like, whoa, she finds deals for me. I want to listen some more to see what she's doing next for a deal. And then it allows you to track how many um, connections you make through that podcast directly in their followers. Great. That's great. Yeah. Okay. I think that is it for the questions. Uh, Alyssa, great information. Thanks for sharing so many secrets. I uh, can't wait to, to see what you share with us on the 11th. Um, so just a reminder again, two more sessions in this series. February 11th, Alyssa will be back with us. And then on the 25th, we wrap up the series with John from On Demand um, Staffing. I hope to see you then. Uh, thanks again for joining us and I uh, hope you all have a wonderful day. Take awesome. Care. Thanks, guys. And I'll follow up with worksheets. And anyone's welcome to email me questions too if they think of something later on today. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Bye, all.